have an outstanding panel here today. Uh, Charles Chu is one, of the, is one of the faculty. He couldn't make it. Um, but we're really fortunate to have Mike Eisen, who's a professor here. He dressed up for us. He has to go to graduation right after this. <coughs> uh, Daniel Venton is at KQED. Bob Sanders is a, a media coordinator here. And Allison Farrell is a senior editor at Nature Medicine. So I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves briefly. And they're going to tell you about what they do in their day jobs and also how they relate to media. Um, and then what we're going to do is open it up to questions. And I hope we have lots of questions uh, about you know, things that we can ask is how do we, uh, somebody who isn't media savvy, reach out? What's good? What's bad? What are some things they want to see? What do they don't, not want to see? So Mike, if we could start with you. Can you introduce yourself? Hi. As you said, I'm Mike Eisen. I'm a professor here in molecular cell biology and integrative biology. I run a lab that does not study virology. Um, I, although I did, I did my PhD as a virologist, so I'm, I'm okay. Um, we study flies, um, mostly developmental biology, but we also study um, how microorganisms manipulate animal behavior using flies and fly pathogens as a model. Um, I've also been involved in science communication in a lot of different ways over the years, so I 20 years ago almost now, founded the Public Library of Science, um, you know, which is a, a bunch of open access journals. But one of our uh, main interests in doing so was to try to do a better job of, um, of having the scientific community interact with the public and communicate the, the, the results of what we do and the, the how and why of what we do to, to the public. And it's been something I've been interested in for quite a long time. I interact with the media a lot. Um, primarily because of my um, work in publishing and open science. Um, although in the last several months, it's been mostly about politics since I somewhat insanely um, <laughs> several months ago decided to get involved in politics after the election and am going to be running for Dianne Feinstein's US Senate seat. Um, although I have to say, I, I'm not speaking as a UC faculty and making that statement since I'll get in trouble. Um, uh, yeah, and and you know I, I'm very I'm very interested in in uh, broader issues and trying to help scientists communicate with the public and and I think more importantly trying to make it uh, an okay thing for scientists to spend their time and energy on interacting with the public and the media and to try to make it uh, a central part of what we do as scientists, especially publicly funded scientists. So. I look forward to hearing all your questions. My name is Danielle Venton, and I work at KQED. I do some science reporting there, um, some science editing. And then I also fill in um, for newscasts and uh, on the California Report. Um, I've been working in science communication for about 10 years now. And so it is only through the generosity of the time um, of scientists that I am able to do my job at all. So I'm very happy to be here and answer any questions you guys have. Uh, and I'm Bob Sanders. I'm uh, in the media relations office at UC Berkeley. I'm the manager of science communications. And I've been here for 26 years and before that uh, for eight years at UC San Francisco. Uh, and my main job is actually to interface between the media and our faculty, our researchers. And uh, so I work very closely with um, the scientists here on the campus to get them to talk about their research in as simple terms as possible with the, the, the least jargon as possible and by means of press releases to uh, interest the media in, their, in, the, in the research that you're, they're doing and that, and, and that UC Berkeley is uh, most proud of. And uh, I actually even get uh, not only on individual stories work with media but we also our office at Media Relations offers um, media training workshops, uh, day-long workshops with uh, faculty and administrators to teach them uh, how best to interact with the media, how to uh, you know, simplify their points, um, distill their, their, their points that they want to uh, uh, communicate to the media, and, um, and how to appear well uh, and effectively on television, uh, radio, as well as in print. So uh, that's... I, that's something I do every day, and it's, it's a lot of fun. I'm Alison Farrell. I'm a, a manuscript editor at Nature Medicine, which is one of the biomedical research journals within the Nature family of journals. Uh, I've been there 16 years. I handle infectious disease for the journal. 
And Nature Medicine is one of the nature journals that has both what we call a front half and a back half. So as you know, the nature journals, that are our primary audience are is um, scientists. However, Nature Medicine and Nature Biotech and Nature um, have a news section. And those are um, meant to be accessible to a non-scientist audience. Um, so we do have those two mechanisms for outreach. Um, we also have meeting series in which um, that's another method for our efforts to communicate science, some of which also have public, public lectures in order to engage the general public uh, in the science that's being presented and the science in the journals themselves and that sort of thing. So I also look forward to your questions. Okay, so now you know who we have here. A lot of expertise up at the front. Um, don't be intimidated. This is all about being able to talk to the media. So if people could start with questions. Anybody have a question? Uh, there we go. Excellent. Um, I was wondering if you guys could touch upon, um, you know, there's a lot of things that I, that despite broad scientific consensus like global warming, vaccination safety, GMOs. Um, there's a lot of public lobbying against and there's a lot of um, American public opinion seems very split on it despite the broad scientific consensus. And many of those, for example, vaccines, there's been studies showing that even when doctors reassure patients of the safety of vaccines, they still don't believe it even if they say that there's scientific evidence. Um, so I was wondering how um, you guys suggest or see us kind of battling against this and trying to bring scientific consensus into the mainstream public opinion. I have some thoughts on that. Okay, before you answer that, I just want to introduce <laughs> our, uh, our fifth panelist, Charles Chu. So Charles is a professor of uh, laboratory medicine uh, and infectious diseases, and I invited him because Charles uh, has been featured in a number of different uh, media, so print and television and everything. If you've, if you've watched the news, then you'll see Charles on the TV. So that's, uh, that's our, our fifth panel. So now I think we can get back to your question, which is how do we communicate when science seems to say something, but there's the anti-vaxxers and all these things. So I don't know who wants to start. I'll take a stab at it. I mean, everyone is trying to figure that out, right? It's really hard, and if there was a simple answer, we wouldn't be in such a big problem. I think a good place to start is understanding that it's, it's not that we don't have enough information. It's not that people are these empty vessels that you just need to put more information and more data into to convince them. They have these values, they have these loyalties, um, and you need to, to kind of, or a, a way to try is to try to get them on your team by talking about shared values. You know, everyone wants to keep their kids safe. And then this is where the power of stories can come in because that connects with people's emotions. And I mean, that is at least an approach, but I don't think anyone has <laughs> a, a, a foolproof way of, of addressing that. Yeah, I mean, I think th these have been, I mean, tough issues. I mean, I've spent a lot of time talking about GMOs in, in, in particular, and I think one of the things I, I think that's worth noting is, you know, as a scientific community, we can't just show up in these conversations only when, uh, you know, it reaches a certain, you know, high level, high level of interest to the, to the public and high, high degree of, of political importance because it, it, we don't show up as kind of trusted, um, uh, Parties. I mean, people trust scientists. They trust science in general, but they don't. We, we, they don't really know what when we ha when we come to them and say, "Yeah, you should you should trust us because, you know, we think GMOs are safe." We have no track record really of communicating with them about science in general. You know, they don't really understand what we do. We haven't shown much of an interest in um, in engaging the public in science when it's not dealing with you know difficult and controversial issues where people come to where, where the public comes to the table with preformed pre notions like one of the things we need to do a, just a generally better job of is is investing in communicating with the public when we're not talking about things like uh, GMOs we should be talking about you know the role of science in agriculture and other and other areas when it's when it's not a hot button issue so that when we're dealing with something like GMOs or we're dealing with like vaccination the public knows that you know what what scientists they know more about what we do and and, and sort of how we approach problems and why they should um, why they should have faith in what we're telling them, or at least 
give us a chance to explain what, what we have to say. Um, and, and, you know, I think we make, we make a mistake when we, when we just focus on those issues and not think that we have a broader job to, to, to communicate with them. Good. Next question. So uh, my question connects back to that as well, but um, I've actually tried a lot to talk to people about vaccination, um, both, you know, and I, when I try to do it from the side of, so I lived in Santa Cruz for a while, so I'll preface with that, um, and I um, had um, my second child in Santa Cruz and became very concerned as kind of measles just at that time was coming up the coast, and I was trying to at least in my own circle of people around me, try to convince everybody to vaccinate their kids and help keep my infant safe. And um, what I found shocking was that people were more comfortable speaking to me as a mom than as a PhD. And only if I would get into any kind of emotional story could I really maybe move them at all. But facts and numbers, and but, but then it takes us away from the actual you know, when you try to engage people with these kind of more emotional connections, then I, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you guys have kind of practical ideas to how to walk that balance and do public outreach in a way that really is still true to the science, but gets across to people. I, um, I did a story about, uh, about the vaccination rate in Sebastopol a couple years ago. And um, what I tried to do was start with a story of um, a mom, excuse me, who was struggling, who had been struggling with the question of vaccines and uh, int introduced the topic through her story. And she had, de had decided to vaccinate her kids. And you know, then I spoke to experts who were able to give talk about the weight of scientific opinion on that, and then wrapped it up by kind of continuing her story a little bit. And so I was, try I was trying to get a narrative arc and uh, while also having the weight of scientific opinion behind there. I mean, you can, you, you can do both. I think there is the larger problem of people feeling alienated by science and whether or not we need we have to start a lot earlier with our kids um, and in terms of outreach in schools themselves so that it's a more comfortable environment. But I think the other thing that we've seen in the last election cycle, people don't know how to digest fact from or distinguish fact from fiction. And we probably don't do any better at ensuring people that what comes from scientists' mouths is you know, fact-based. So there has to be a lot more than just outreach, individual outreach efforts. It has to be a more global connection. And a, I would say a connection with physicians as well, at least in terms of you know, the vaccine arena, that we also don't ignore groups. Because certainly in terms of some of the, the things going on um, today in terms of concerns about autism and lack of vaccination, there was, some, there was some news just earlier this week, that I think if we ignore groups, it leaves them open to other um, roots of information and other and susceptibility to information that may be incorrect but may touch more at an emotional level. And when we dismiss because we know it's true, that's part of the problem. And also, I mean, I think w one thing, again, this mostly comes from, from interacting about GMOs but also vaccination is, is just, you know, people, I think we, we tend to mis misplace the problem. People People trust science. They're not, they don't, it's not that they're denying the idea of evidence or, or study, but they really distrust science as an institution. And I, I, I don't really blame them that much. I mean, most of what comes out of scientists' mouths in the media is bullshit. And we, we go around saying stuff all the time about how, you know, you know, we're gonna, you know, scientific leaders and scientists, you know, habitually overstate the value of what, you know, money's gonna bring. They habitually overstate the things that they found in their, their research. They are, are constantly arguing that, you know, science is gonna solve all these you know societal problems if we just if we if we just unleash its its power and, and rarely talk about the downside of of science and I, I think the public has you know reasonably good um, uh, reasons to mistrust 
to mistrust science as an institution. And so I think the, the, the thing that's worked for me, at least on, on some level, is to break away from that, to, to acknowledge all the problems that there are with science as an institution and not be just going out there and saying, yeah, science, we're gonna kick ass. And, um, but instead to, to try to connect to people as an individual scientist. And, and you know, I try to explain to people you know, why, I have, why I have no problem eating GMOs, why I vaccinate my children, what it is that, that, um, that you know, you know, and at the same time saying, yeah, I think, you know, a, a lot of the stuff the company says is really evil. I wouldn't trust them either. And, and just to try to uh, uh, not be so unwilling to criticize science as an institution. And I think a lot of scientists, especially when they're speaking in public, feel like, you know, they have to be, um, you know, super positive and super cheerleady about, about science and its institutions in general. And I think that that actually tends to work against us, that if we, if, we, if we sort of relate to people as skeptical consumers of what our own sort of industry says, it, 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 it tends to, to, to work better, to work better with them. I think people don't want to have their concerns, I, don't th I think people don't want to have their concerns dismissed. You know, it's not necessarily unreasonable to, to be worried about things that are new or, you know, that most people trust. I'd like to give a viewpoint, actually, as a physician scientist, because I, I do see patients as, as well as do science. And, and I can tell you, um, I, I think, I think the, the question is going to be at a, at a different level. If you want to engage, say, individuals on a personal level, many of their you know, preconceived notions may have, they typically come from either strong anecdotal or family experiences or personal experiences. And as a result, it becomes very difficult as a scientist to simply just communicate the results of clinical trials or tests. I mean, it, it pretty much goes in one ear and out. And I think to some extent, um, as, as clinicians, we're already very, uh, we're very familiar with the idea of engaging patients. We have to engage patients, otherwise we, we, we'd, be, we'd be unable to diagnose or take care of them. And, and I think similarly, scientists have to find a way to engage not only the public, but to engage individuals on on, on, on a more personal level. So there, there have to be, there, I believe that there, there have to be mechanisms by which perhaps forums, um, you know, small groups, uh, some sort of mechanism by which scientists can really communicate uh, to, uh, directly to individuals and, and to, to be able to make an impact. Um, and I also like to point out in the, uh, the particular role, and I think in, in this case it would be kind of the role of a physician scientists in sort of contributing to this discussion because um, you know, many of these, um, in some ways, um, we, we're coming from a vantage point where we already have you know, patients who are asking us questions and, and who want to know answers, uh, and, you know, in some cases very uh, regarding kind of you know, how, how, how should they care for their children, et cetera. So, so I think that in some ways it may provide us an opportunity uh, through, uh, for instance, physicians being able to, to basically provide science education along with physician scientists and scientists as well. But, but I think overall, um, I think that in some ways scientists have to engage the public or en at least engage individuals in the same, in the same way that uh, physicians uh, engage their patients. Yes, I agree entirely with what's been said about the, the role of the scientist in, in the misunderstanding by the public of what science is, and we, we're not doing our job very well there. But I would like to talk to the science uh, journalist. I've been discussing, actually, that, that issue with, uh, with an editor of uh, New Scientist in London not, not too long ago. It seems to me that science journalism is doing a very good job. I've seen a lot of really good stuff being written for the public um, in describing uh, research um, results, uh, what can you expect. But I think one of the, the root of misunderstanding between public and scientists is that the public doesn't understand, doesn't know, hasn't been told or taught what is the process of getting data in science. And they, they see something very linear, rigorous, uh, black or white. And when I tell this to, to, neuro, to science uh, journalists and say, well, you should also educate the people, not just report on, on data, but also explain you know, the role of statistics, the role of uh, we understand this, we think that there is 95% chance that it's true. And the, the process itself, I think, is not really well explained to the public. And I think if we 
we are doing an effort also in this direction. We may be able to have a better understanding between, between public and scientists. So I appeal to the science journalists to think about that because when I talk to them, they say, well, that's not our job. Our job is to describe you know, the latest finding on this and that. I think it should be their job. <laughs> so I, I, well, I also think it should be the job of scientists. I think you know we, you know, we should take more of a responsibility for explaining what we do. I mean, I, I, this is something I, I, I've been trying to get more scientists to do for for years. I think part part of the reason we we, you know, 20 years ago we started to to, to try to get pa get to create a, a publishing system in which everything was available to the public and not just available to people who subscribe to journals was the hope that scientists would start to conceive of the audience for their for 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 their work as being broader than just the narrow you know four or five people in their field who are actually going to read their papers for technical reasons and to start to try to 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 effectively communicate not just you know the two paragraph um, highlights of, of, of how what they discovered is going to end disease but um, but what they did and, and how they found it and, and I think we still very very few scientists take the time either as part of the way they publish their papers or around the way they, they do the work to explain the, the the process of what they've done to the public and if anything they, they do the opposite I've had you know m many fights with people over cases in which you know someone publishes a paper that has you know an interesting result but it's you know it's 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 you know it has it says you know it's p value of 95% or something and then they go and talk to the public and they say we're 99.99% sure that this is the right thing that 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 people feel like the public is incapable of engaging with science in its own terms that with its ambiguity with the fact that much of what you discover is going to turn out to be wrong and so it, rather than even communicating that we actively hide that uh, from the public, and I think that that it's something that yes, I agree that science journalists should try to tackle the problem, but it's very hard for a journalist who has a lot of stories to do to spend you know months or years in a lab you know tracking the a, a, a subject from its initial conception to its discovery. But the scientists who are, who, who did it can and and should take much more of their time and effort to try to ex explain that to the public than they do. And it's something we have to teach scientists how to do. They're not particularly good at that kind of communication for the most part. But but I think trying to sort of shove that off and say that's the something journalists should do is, is not realistic. It's something w we have to do ourselves. It'd be great if they could. I just don't, I, I think, and I hope they do, but I think we also have to take responsibility for it. I, I think that, um, that you can actually find stories about the process of science out there. There's a lot of long, long form journalism that does get into the details, but you have to realize too, the audience that these science writers are writing for are busy people who are not going to read those details even if they do put them in the story. I mean, you're reading the daily newspaper in order to get some facts, and you're, you're scanning most of the stories, probably not even reading beyond the first two or three graphs. So um, it's not uh, really beneficial for the, uh, the, the daily science writer to put all those details into the story. They can find, it's like in the New Yorker and places like that, and uh, many places on the internet, uh, those stories that do get into the process. And when I work with a, a, a researcher at Berkeley, I encourage them to, to, put, to give me a little of the process and I can put it in my story. It seldom ends up in the, the stories that are reported in the, 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 the mainstream media, however, because of that very thing. Um, they have to write short and that's because their audience reads short. So. I'm gonna take the, we have a lot of questions out here, which is great, but I wanna ask one. So I'm taking the chair's prerogative here. So I'm a young uh, faculty member, I, I, this is hypothetical, young faculty member and I have a, I have a paper in PLOS pathogens or nature medicine. I'm really excited, I, I'm curing the world. I wanna tell the world how we're curing whatever disease it is. So how do I get from A to B? I know how to publish in a journal, we all do this, right? But, but taking it to uh, a news release or actually getting the attention of a, of a radio personality, how do we do that? And I wanna start with, Charles, because Charles, you've, uh, I want to hear about the first time that you had any exposure to the media. How did it, how did it start and then how did it build from there? Because you're, you're frequently uh, cited. And then I want to hear from sure. the other panelists uh, on how sure. this actually so, works. Um, 
So, so, so typically, um, so at UCSF and probably with other institutions, um, th there's a there's an active press office, and and um, I would I would say that um, my, the first time I actually became exposed to it was a paper that I I did publish in PLOS Pathogens. Um, it was about a an adenovirus outbreak um, in in the UC Davis monkey colony, and so I, I think that my the, the way it went was that. Um, if you have a story that you think might be of interest, say to the public, or or some a basic a story that you may want to disseminate, and you feel that the findings would be a, something that would be of interest, uh, what you can do is for the for for most press offices, you can you can basically um, approach your press officer, just send him or her an email, um, and actually just try to engage them. And you know, essentially, what you have to do is, is you have to be a reporter. You actually have to pitch the story internally to to you to your institution, and, and then if you're institution is engaged and wants to proceed with it, uh, it it's really your, the institution that will kind of take the next steps in, in terms of trying to uh, interest journalists with your story uh, or, or try to present your story. Maybe they may issue a press release, for instance. Um, so um, what I would say is that um, you, you want to be very active, uh, especially if you feel that your findings and your publication if you, uh, has, has something to say, has something that would be of interest, and you, if you're afraid that, it, that, that if you just not do any sort of publicity, that it may get lost, uh, sort of, in, or may only be read by scientists, um, it's really, um, uh, in, in some ways, uh, you, nowadays, um, as scientists, you can't just be a scientist uh, hold off in a laboratory. You really have to find, be active in finding some ways of communicating your findings. And especially with um, the onset of kind of open source uh, journals as well, I mean, there, there are literally hundreds of thousands of papers that are being published. So in, in some ways, this is, um, I think your work is not done simply by publishing. Uh, you have to find some way to really disseminate your findings. So um, I would encourage you to approach your press office to be aggressive. Um, there are other mechanisms of actually getting your research out there. Um, you know, you, you could you could start a scientific blog, or you could even um, you could speak, you could basically email some of the blog editors and see if they'd be willing to post it on a blog. Um, I, I've actually found that uh, blogs are actually a very useful way of sort of condensing your paper so that. Um, you know, the lay public may not want to read your paper, um, or they may only read the abstract. And so a blog can give you another way of sort of presenting your data um, in, in sort of a, a format uh, that's readable, and it doesn't need to be, you know, taken up by, by a major publication in that event. Um, another way you can disseminate is uh, to your, um, disseminate your findings are, are typically through Twitter. Um, I know kind of Mark is <laughs> very active at that, but, but, uh, but, but I, I find tw Twitter is a good way to quickly disseminate to, the, to kind of your colleagues in the scientific community. And from there, um, you know, if it does gain traction, you'll, you'll, you'll have some sort of metric to know how, uh, how much interest your particular study will have to the, to the lay public. And I'll relinquish. Bob, Charles comes to you and says, I have this great idea. So I want to know, you know, how, what percentage of, of people who contacted you actually go out and put a press release? And uh, how, how, what do you like to see from them? And, and how do you filter that? Well, I, I like his uh, suggestion that you uh, distill, when you, when you first reach out, that you distill in a very few sentences a pitch about why this is interesting. Uh, and not, not, not tell me the details, but why the world would care why, about this research and, and then why I should write about it and try to, to interest science writers. But um, I probably turn down uh, 10 for every one that I write about, and, and it's probably higher because not everybody reaches out. And uh, I, I, you know, every week, Nature, Science, PNAS, Cell, all of them alert us to upcoming articles. And, those are probably the 20, 25 more or more that uh, I have to sort of look at and decide whether it's, uh, I can spend my time writing about it. I would say that don't be discouraged. If I say no, that doesn't necessarily mean I don't find your work interesting. It means I may not have the time to write about it. Uh, uh, I may not think this is the, the right time in the research and maybe more uh, stronger results might make for a better pickup in the media. Um, don't give up and say, I'm not interested, but uh, next time you have another, a paper, let me know again. Also, I, I mean, I, I'd also encourage people to interact more with journalists who, when they're not, when they don't have something from their own lab. I mean, I, I say for every, every time I would send a, 
report or something from my own lab, I'm send, I send them 20 or 30 things from other people's labs that I think are interesting and, and, and not just try to be uh, all, all about, you know, self-promotion, but just try to, to, to figure, you know, to, to know that you have good eyes and ears out in the community and when you hear cool work from somebody else to let, to let people know about it. And then uh, my experience, then they're, they're, you know, they're, they're tuned to listen to you as someone who has some, some judgment and, and whatever. I, you know, I, I, my, own, my own style now is, is, I, is to just communicate my own work myself. I mean, I write, essentially write my own press releases by, through, a, through a blog. And then, you know, it's taken a while to get to this point, but there's enough people who listen to what I have to say that, that, that they're willing to pick it up. And, and, you know, even now, we sort of don't even bother with journals at that point where, where most of the news coverage of my work that's happened in, say, the last five years has been the result of preprints that we post and then, you know, notify people either with a blog or by sending stuff out on Twitter about what we're doing, and then it, it, it gets picked up. It, it's, not that, it's not easy for someone who doesn't have a, already have an audience to do, but, but you, can, you can build that, especially as you're starting off as a professor, try to build your, build your audience and just recognize it has long-term value to, to kind of invest in that kind of, in that kind of effort. From the journal side Just of things. Just one quick comment. I also wanted to say that um, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to uh, talk about someone else's research. Uh, take advantage of your opportunities because um, I've actually found that um, in some ways it sort of um, opens up kind of connections for you, um, and uh, it, it it does eventually become reciprocated. Where um, if you, you if you talk about someone's well depending on whether or not you're talking favorably or unfavorably. But, but, but in general, if you're talking about someone's research, it, it does reciprocate because in turn, uh, you know, that person would be, uh, would be kind of an independent uh, evaluator, at least to the media, uh, of kind of your work once it's published. From the journal side of things, you can also contact the editor who handled your, your paper. And we have a press office as well. And so you can be put in, you can put your press office into contact with our press office. You can ask directly whether or not we intend to, because we also write press releases. Not every paper, again, is press released, but every paper actually is distributed to journalists one week before online publication. So there is that sort of avenue as well um, that you, sh you should at least attempt. Um, and then also make sure that the press office in your, at your institution is in contact with our press office. And the other thing would be to, even prior to publication, that you go, you submit your abstract to large meetings where there is a journalist presence, unlike maybe some smaller meetings, and where, you know, if you have a short talk or if you have a poster, you may actually have some exposure in that venue as well. I have a very basic question. Uh, how do you get the public to be interested in an issue that does not really affect their day-to-day -day life? For example, how do you convince someone that you have to finish your course of antibiotics because if you don't, then you would be contributing to the development of multi-drug resistance? Or you should like get emission tests done on your vehicle because if not, you're contributing to global warming. I mean, these might be b bad examples, but yeah, how do you inculcate a sense of responsibility in them through media? It, it, you don't, it doesn't always have to be something that affects their daily lives, right? I mean, dinosaurs don't affect people's day-to-day <laughs> -day lives, and yet they're right. There, there are there. You know, the the public, the public is really like. I mean, I work on flies. Nobody. Nobody cares about flies uh, in, in a day-to-day -day basis, right? Uh, I mean, maybe in the, the kitchen they have to. But I, I just think, actually, I think we underestimate the extent to which the public is just interested in kind of weird and interesting scientific topics. It, it's harder to get them animated enough to do something politically about it. I mean, antibiotic resistance is a good example. I mean, there's plenty of coverage in the media. People are interested in it, but they're, they don't. They don't, we haven't reached through and getting them to care about it in a, in a political sense, but, but getting them interested in stuff like that is, I think, is less difficult. Trying to figure out why it's, you're trying to communicate to them why it's important that they try to turn that into, into political action is, is more complicated. And antibiotic resistance is an issue because we've, you know, you know I don't think we've, fig we've figured out how to get people to, to, to care about it yet, but. Yeah, I mean, all uh, space science stories don't affect people's yeah. daily lives, but they're, people love space stories because it's just cool. There's the yeah. wow factor. <laughs> Bacteria that can kill you are also fascinating. Also really right? cool. <laughs> like, like, they'll be interested. Yeah. Yeah, 
question. You may have to approach it from a personal perspective. Like, um, I mean, certainly antibiotic resistance is, uh, affects people's lives every day. So if there's an, a personal narrative that can help um, you pitch the story to someone, get, get that interest, uh, that's what Danielle probably does all the time, is look for that personal story that can uh, introduce the, the story, but then you can get into the details after you've got people's, you've grabbed people's interest. I would say that um, I used to write for, uh, for Wired uh, daily and would write, um, would write mostly discovery stories. You know, group of scientists found this thing. And um, ideally, my editor would like five stories a day. I would try to speak to at least three people for one story. You know, it was incredibly overworked. Um, and those are kind of, there's, there's a churn to those stories. I would say now I'm much more interested in doing stories where there's a trend, where there's, you know, uh, trying to correct a misunderstanding. I mean, the, the way that I, the kind of stories that I look for has evolved as, as I've grown a little bit. Um, as an uh, infectious scientist, and we all understand and the research results and that we're generating here can be a double-edged sword. And, uh, you know, we're trying to control the uh, disease and uh, cure it, and, but uh, these can be uh, used and for some other bad purposes as well. And we just found this bug, and with a easy mutation that we can... Uh, uh, have in it and would make it very, very lethal. And how, as a scientist, and what's your opinion and uh, what your advice and how should we communicate this into the general public? I think transparency is um, very important. Um, in terms, I mean, there are restrictions on what you can and can't do and can and can't publish, um, depending on whether you're working with, um, depending on what agent you're working with. Um, there are actually in place some guidelines re related to that. Um, but I think that always presenting um, the benefits and the disadvantages and um, the degree to which you feel that science can mitigate the disadvantages. But I do think it, that you ha the onus is on you to be transparent about the potential risks and benefits. Yeah, and also I, I, think, I think there's, you know, Occasionally, try, you know, scientists saying, "Okay, maybe there are some things we shouldn't do." I think, I think, you know, in general, I think people's fears are are often misplaced. But uh, actually, there there is stuff that happens, in, especially in infectious diseases, where I think people people have, uh, you know, wandered into areas that I'm that make even me nervous. And I I, I feel like we, we again have a there's a reluctance of scientists to acknowledge that that sometimes even we're uncomfortable with, with things that people do. And it doesn't necessarily mean that we, that we, that we shouldn't do them, but, but getting involved in these discussions, not you know, admitting that, that, that there, there are dangers to the kind of stuff we do, both literal dangers, you know, something can get out of a lab and, and cause problems, but, but that more you know, longer term dangers that technology just doesn't always turn out to be, to be a good thing. And I think we're, you know, if, if we confronted that issue more as a community and, and sort of were thoughtful and, and uh, in, in thinking about it, I, I feel like the public would, again, have a little bit more faith in our, our, in our judgment on these things. Right now, they think that, you know, all of us spend all of our time in our labs trying to cook up ways of destroying the world. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I don't think they have any reason not to, not to think that, given, given the way that we talk, at least. I I have to say I agree with Mike that I think the public's perception of scientists is that they don't have a good track record in monitoring the bad effects of their discoveries. And uh, the, I think scientists need to be more serious in their attempts to regulate some of these discoveries. I know uh, with genetic engineering and synthetic biology and CRISPR now, there's talk about um, the ethical issues around them. But I think the public perceives it mostly as talk. And is anyone really watching to make sure nothing bad happens with this new technology? So I think there's a, there's a trust issue here that the public has with scientists around that. Yeah. I, would, I would say to the gentleman's point before, when interested in 
seeing more uh, coverage of the process of science. You know, I, I've asked scientists how sure they are of their discoveries or, or if they think that any, there could be any negative effects from them. And, and some people are very open and some people are defensive and say, you know, I'm, it's not possible that I'm not right or, you know. Um, and so I would just encourage everyone to, to kind of be honest and, and if there is room for doubt, you know, accept that. And, I think uh, we talked about dinosaur space and vi you know viruses that can kill you as things that it grab attention. Um, you know, I think we know that also that uh, on social media, what goes viral becomes public perception. Uh, I was uh, you know Jonas Berger is a professor who wrote a book on on what goes viral, and uh, he actually looked at science articles in the New York Times, and he he found uh, statistically discovered that uh, what the, the articles that got vi went viral ended up being awe inspiring, or they could, they they were able to rate it on a different scale and. And so I'm curious to ask the panel, what types, is, is there something, are there characteristics of ideas or concepts that, that for some reason go viral uh, more than others, I, whether or not they're true, uh, you know, independent of their objectivity? Uh, and, and, you know, what, if so, what are those things in your experience that, that, uh, um, that pop out? Uh, the biggest story we've had at KQED for a while, at least in terms of like web clicks, which we try not to care about, but we do look at, um, <laughs> um, was a, a picture of the, or pictures of the super bloom from, from space or from planes uh, that people, people just loved. I mean, they were really easy to understand. It connected to the drought. It connected to flowers in spring. And, you know, why that went viral, I, I don't know. But it maybe, maybe it did touch uh, feelings of awe. It was, you know, I also, you know, the, the, the biggest story, you know, all the articles PLOS has published in over the years, by far the one that got the most attention was about bat fellatio. So I think, um, um, you know, there's, um, there's, there's certainly, you know, the more, the, the more purient the issue, the, the, the more likely things are to take off. But, you know, from my own experience, it's very hard, it's very hard to know, I think, you know, I wrote, you know, of all the science I've written in my life, of all the things I've ever written about and talked about, the thing that got, has gotten the most attention was a blog post I wrote about dueling robots on Amazon bidding up the price of a textbook that we were interested in. You know, people get, which has, you know, a hundred times more hits than the cumulative amount of my science has in, in, in all, all of its history. You know, people get interested in things that, that are that are kind of weird and a little bit futuristic and you know, ro you know robots and and I, I don't know. It's if we if people knew how to predict that stuff, y y you could start a new marketing firm. And it's, it's, <laughs> I think it's a little it's it's hard to tell. Cool photos and cool videos though uh, are going to help a lot. Um, text alone doesn't uh, go viral, but uh, if you've got something. Uh, and look at all the cat videos out there. Yeah. Sound never goes viral either. <laughs> That's true. There's no piece of radio ever has. <laughs> yeah. I had a question going back to, you know, blogs and internet and everything. And I have the feeling that, you know, I may be wrong, but many of these ideas about this mistrust about science come actually a lot of from internet. Like from, you know, it's so easy for someone that has a question that goes to internet. And I was teaching recently a class in, you know, measles. Of course I went to internet to get what's, you know, some cool pictures, but then you end up on all this anti-vaccination site, right? You look at HIV and you find out sites from Berkeley telling, oh, HIV is not, AIDS is not caused by HIV. So there's really no, so much data and not really something that will tell you know, the public, yes, that's absolutely true. I mean, how they will discern, not knowing Mike, for example, that that's you know, truth to all information rather than looking at someone else. And uh, so I feel there is this really this lack of things. And the information is there. I mean, if people, but people would not go to PubMed. People would not go to, I feel, to you know, a lot of different mass media you know, information that don't talk to them. And I was wondering if, you know, journal like PLOS, like open access, that should not be their role as well, to have not a PLOS one, not a PLOS pathogen, but very uh, something to distribute for the mass media and for the mass population, information about what's happening. Yeah, 
I mean, I mean you know, for, first of all, people do go to PubMed. I mean, you, you know, right, a huge fraction of the, the, the hits on PubMed are not from scientists. They're from public looking for medical information. So people do have a, you know, certain parts of the population do have an interest in going to uh, resources. I, you know, my answer to that is, you know, we, something we've talked about for a long time with sort of PLOS being, being uh, or, or science in general kind of taking on the mantle of trying to explain what's true. It's very hard to do. The, 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 the way I would suggest doing it is, is the, the place people always do go is Wikipedia for a lot of this stuff. And there are in some scientific fields a, a pretty concerted efforts to keep the information that's on Wikipedia um, both up to date and accurate, but also accessible. And I, I think if there's any one thing people could do that would be be more, you know, benef beneficial in their in their areas, it would be focusing on the information that that that's in your field that's relevant to the public that's on on Wikipedia, keeping it you know up to date, accessible, keeping it linked to the to 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 good reliable sources of information. There are very few topics like vaccination, GMOs, where you're going to have a lot of pushback. Mostly it's, it's neglect, not, not opposition that, that is the reason people don't have, have good information. And, you know, it's just, it's something I think people should, should look upon as, as, as part of their responsibility as a scientist is to, is to keep that information up to date. Rather than creating something new, Wikipedia exists. We use it. We should, we should make it better. Just to rebut on that, I know, for example, as an example, that what can be done, I know MCB 200. I mean, one of the class taught at Berkeley. The students, as part of an assignment, have to write one Wikipedia page on, you know, something related to what they were taught or something like that. But that's how you can potentially put some good and stuff. Classes too. The problem is that yeah. you know they do it. It then they don't. <laughs> then it just sort of sits Keep there. It, it's something yeah. that I think more active scientists need to do, not just as a like I'm going to do this one day, but but to sort of take it upon themselves. The, the best places in Wikipedia for scientific information have a small group of people who are dedicated to keeping that information up to date and to growing it into related areas. Things like that, I think, would be would be more valuable than almost anything else you you can do. Okay, I think we have time for one more question uh, because we don't want to disrupt the UC Berkeley gra graduation here. So one more question. Uh, thanks. Okay, I guess I'm, this sort of follows on what you were saying about Wikipedia, you know, with, with regard to the um, kind of moving from just informing to informing or um, engaging people to take political action on, on topics that are, you know, have science as a relevant component to it. I'm wondering if, um, from your either your experience um, interacting with the media or with particular groups or resources, or from what you just personally have looked at, if you have any recommend recommendations for useful resources for people who are interested in engaging with that, helping make that transition for things that need to kind of be moving into the political decision making process. I mean, I could answer it, but I've been talking a lot. I want to let someone else have a chance. I think we can hear from each of you sort of final thoughts on how best as a scientist to engage each of you. You each have your own particular streams of how you deal with the media. So what do you think, uh, maybe starting with Allison, the best way to reach you? I know that we get the paper published, but then what's the best way to interact with you and what resources outside of your journal do you think are, are good? And maybe you can each talk about that. I'm not sure if this answers Amy's question, though, um, by, by answering your question. Um, in terms of reaching an editor in general, where our information is easily accessed, in terms, I mean, and we can be a connection to, as I mentioned, Nature Medicine has a news section. We can be a connection to the journalists who run the news section. Um, in terms of then moving on, moving an important issue into the political domain. Um, I guess you have to first move it, move it into that public domain. Uh, how you transition from there, I'm not sure. One thing that we didn't that we touched upon a little bit was the fact that in general scientists aren't trained to do any of this. Right? You start a lab. You're not trained to train anybody. You're not trained to write grants. You're not trained to um, manage interpersonal conflicts, and you're not trained to now. Sorry, run for Senate. <laughs> so it's a constant learning process, and I think that we're all involved in it as these things are so rapidly changing. Um, I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I don't really have an answer either. Um, 
But if you, uh, uh, I mean, I have to say, if you're talking about trusted sources, I mean, I, I, I like to think that university, uh, university news sites are actually a good trusted source uh, in medical centers and, and, and as, as well as universities. And um, I, I have to say, though, that I often go to Wikipedia, so I really wish scientists would keep Wikipedia <laughs> up to date. Um, well, the best way to reach me is through you know, email or Twitter um, about how to move scientific information into the political realm. I mean, I, I don't think it's the media's job to do that. Media that advocates for political activity makes me just, I just don't trust it, whatever side it's pointing towards. Um, I mean, for that, there's things like, there's groups like Indivisible or Swing Left, um, or whatever, you know, there's, there's groups out there that will do whatever you want to do. Um, I mean, I think that just petitioning your representatives can be helpful to, if you wanna see, you know, new laws. Um, there was, there was some new figures about California's vaccination rate that were very, very favorable, that the, that more kids are getting vaccinated than were in previous years, and that was because there's a new law in effect that makes it, um, it just puts more barriers in place for parents that are trying to opt out. So, I mean, you know, good old, like, calling up your congressman <laughs> um, is, is a way to see that change if you want to. And I, I guess I'd, I'd add, you know, <laughs> There is, the answer to your question is there is no answer to the question. I mean, there is no guide out there to tell you how to do these things. And I, I, you know, of all the of all the issues that have success, you know, the scientific issues that have, you know, that impact the public and that 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 w where there's been a transition sort of from a from the scientific community to the public. I can't think of a single one where somebody said, "Hey, this is an important issue. I'm going to go find someone else to uh, to make the case." For us, I mean, my own experience with 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 science publishing was, you know, I was a postdoc. I was not interested in spending a huge fraction of my time lobbying for something else. And so initially, we figured, well, you know, this is an important issue. I'll write a little bit about this, and that, and then there's some magical force out there in the ether that once you explain that something is important to you, they'll be like, oh, hey, that guy's right. I'm going to go like, to, you know, make this my life's work to do it. It just never works that way. The only way to do it is if you think something's important to do it and the you, you know you, you to, to jump in to the fray I, I you know I, I I had no training in how to how to communicate how to I, w I was not a great writer I was not a you know a, a particularly comfortable public speaker I wasn't I did no idea how to lobby anybody you know from the city council to to congress these are all things I, I figured out how to do mostly by just doing them and fucking up over and over again right and and Right, one of those things I need to learn to do is not swear in public, but um, <laughs> um, um, and and I'm still working on that one. Um, the the although apparently that is the key to political success, but um, the the you know I think I think scientists are too reluctant, right? We are so it's so important to us that we be perfect at at doing things when we expose ourselves to the public, right? Like nobody wants to publish a, a gel in which the way, lanes are all wavy or like we're, we're, we're so conditioned to, to make our public face be a, a, a sort of perfect model of what really happens underneath that we're, we're reluctant to get into the messiness of, of, of lobbying for something and, and trying to advocate for something. But you know, that's to me that's the most important thing for us to do is if you think something's important, just get out there and, and fight for it. Try to convince people it's important, do what it do what it takes. You'll get better and better at doing it. You'll figure out where, where you make mistakes. And sure, people can help you along the way, but you're never gonna find anybody who cares about whatever the issue is as, as much as you do. And, and you know, the, the other thing I've realized from these things is it's incredible. You know, initiative is a really rare commodity in the universe. And just just getting out there and pushing for something, I was astonished how easy it was to march into a member of Congress's office and say, hey, this is an important issue, uh, pay some attention to it. And and you know, it's it I think we think this is really hard to break to break through on these things, but it's not. If you have something that you can make a good case for and, and that's really important, it, it You'll 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 have a chance to 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 make your case if if you push it. It doesn't mean you'll be successful, but but yeah, I would just say just do it. You know, get out there, make mistakes, argue for something, and um, and you know, 
it, it'll work 100 times better than trying to find a, a book or a website or some, some class you can take to try to teach you how to do it. Yeah, I, ju I just want to basically reiterate re re that I completely agree with what um, Mike has said. Um, it's science communication, like anything else, it simply gets better with practice. And um, I, I can tell you, like personally, like the first time I sort of like spoke, I, I completely neg I forgot who the audience was, and I basically just gave my standard, um, you know, lecture about my research. And and so, but but with time, I, th I think as as long as you take advantage of your opportunities and continue to kind of engage in ways in, in different settings. Um, whether it be uh, directly with the media, whether it be in front of a you know congressional meeting, whether whether it be in front of uh, in front of a high school, I mean, it's I, I think that that the more you take advantage of those opportunities, the better you'll get at it, and and be able to better be able to kind of disseminate and and kind of translate your research to others. Okay, so we need to wrap up. This has been fantastic, uh, but it's one thirty, so we're going to have. Uh, 25 minutes out in the sun, socialize, uh, get, a, get a drink, not an alcoholic one yet, not until the reception. Uh, and I want to thank the, the, all the panelists. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you.